Welcome everyone to our Wednesday weekly webinar. And I have a few introductory remarks. My name is Julie Garden Robinson. I'll be your moderator. And our presenter will be Todd Weinman. And I'll introduce Todd a bit more in a couple minutes. So last week, we were trying to do our Sauerkraut and Beyond Food Fermentation 101. That's a presentation by Clifford Hall and I. And unfortunately, our system went down. And we are going to reschedule it for next week. Same time, same place. So if you're interested in that topic, it's kind of an interesting one. There's a lot of interest in probiotics and so on. Please join us next week. We do archive all of these presentations. And we have a huge amount of free information on our website, both our Field to Fork website as well as our Food and Nutrition Extension website. Um, following the Sauerkraut and Beyond, the following week will be Esther McGinnis, who is our assistant professor and horticulturist with plant sciences here on campus. And she's going to talk about growing microgreens in your home. So that should be a very interesting seminar as well. A few logistics. So it looks like you're pretty um, used to using the system, some of you. We have you in listening mode right now. You can go ahead. If you have questions along the way, you can chat those or Type those questions in the chat pod. And I'll keep track of those in case Todd doesn't see those. I'm sure he'll welcome all your questions as we go. And if we miss any, we'll certainly answer those at the end. Or you can give Todd a call. Right, Todd? Um, again, we will have a short survey at the end of the webinar. These are really important. All of these programs and the materials we're developing are made possible through a special grant. And of course, I have to provide some feedback to the grant agency to show what we did with the funding that we received. So we really appreciate you taking about two minutes to answer that survey. And we also will have um, some gift card, or not a gift card, a drawing for something. I haven't decided what the prize is this time. But we will do some prize drawings for those of you who do take the time to do that survey. And you also can print a certificate that shows um, that you are here in case you're getting continuing education. So with that, I am happy to introduce Todd Weinman, a friend of mine as well as an extension agent uh, in agriculture and natural resources, horticulture. And he's going to be talking with us a little bit about the joy of fall bulb planting garlic and tulips. So I'm excited. And here's what Todd looks like. And Todd, I'm going to hand over the mic to you. There's a face for radio right there. Um, <laughs> we'll get off this slide in case some of you have kids watching. Um, if you look at this, what I have here is um, some elephant garlic, um, just another type of um, old plant that we can grow. But I'm going to speak mainly on stiff neck garlic here, and we'll get started. Um, Allium sedum is the is the genus species name of garlic. Here, uh, here I had grown on it and, and basically ripped it apart and um, the picture does not really give it justice, but um, these are just some different, um, these are all from the same bulb, the cloves. Um, just a few things, and you can go back to this, I, I'm assuming, if you if you really want to. But as far as definitions, um, I've got um, this divided into two different talks, basically one on garlic and one on tulips. And for the gar for the garlic one, there'll be, um, there'll be some all definitions and such that you, you might know, you might not know, you know, 100 weight, um, 100 pounds, uh, basically, and prices are marketed, your average for all methods for sale. And these, these are things that you might want to basically keep in mind when you start um, listening to me here. Uh, the leading fresh market garden state is California. I probably should have had a prize for the person who could answer that, but um, I didn't think of that. I know that for... Um, for the prize for what Julie had in mind for this whole um, Field of Forks um, sessions. Um, maybe she could come out and plant some garlic or tulips in your home. It's just a thought. But um, California is the largest producer of garlic, and um, they're just a leader in it. Everyone else is, is rather insignificant. Um, how much compared to everyone else? Um, as you can see, uh, 22,700 acres planted, and the other states combined, um, 1,100. And then you might say, well, how come there wasn't enough, you know, it said harvested, you know, the number's a little bit off there. Uh, the reason is sometimes things happen, crop failure, flooding, um, creatures running through it, destruction. So United States um, is a very large producer of garlic. 
and also as far as price per hundred, um, seventy-one dollars. And a lot of this, um, I found to be quite fascinating, just because um, you don't always think of garlic as a as a money maker. Some of the relatives of it: uh, chives, onions, leeks, and shallots. And I have um, grown all of these before. Um, my favorite, however, is garlic, and and it's just a good time. Um, you plant it in the fall. One thing a lot of people have um, done is plant it in the spring. And in our climate here in North Dakota and in Minnesota also and some of the other northern states, if you plant it and you plant it not when it's in um, season. So for example, if you plant it in a different time than late fall here, what you'll get is a very large onion-like thing. It, it really isn't even very good. It, it's just like, what is this? Um, it needs that cold period to basically come apart. Here's a nice publication. Um, from gardening table with garlic. It goes through a number of different um, things as far as garlic and um, if a person is inter interested in that, it's just H1409. It's easy to find on the internet. Um, like I said, we do stiff neck garlic in our state. Uh, where do you get it? Contact your local nursery. For a while, um, the only place we could we could order it was out on the west coast, uh, Oregon and, and um, Washington. It seemed to be pretty good places, but um, really couldn't find it here in North Dakota. Now it's slowly starting to come in. A lot of the nurseries are are carrying a little bit of it. Um, some of your local food places are carrying it too. And some people will say, well, I just planted the stuff I bought in the store. Many times that's the silver neck garlic, and I'll, I'll tell you why the stiff neck's a little bit better in just a little bit here. What you want to do is break apart the, the bulb, and it, it goes into the cloves. Um, and if you look, there's like a paper-like protective layer around that clove. And what you want is one that's not broken. And also, when you plant it, you want to plant the largest one or, or three or what have you out of that, and the rest you can eat or, or um, give away or what have you. But if you plant the largest one and, the, and, the, and the, the tunic is not broken, you have less chances of diseases, larger type garlics than you would otherwise, and the insects have a hard time getting into there. How deep to plant? Four to six inches, and you're thinking, wow, that is just way too deep. It isn't. If you go less than four inches, many times it won't survive the winter and it'll actually die. Um, what I like to do is where I planted the garlic, I actually throw snow on top of the four to six inches, and it does a lot better than without snow. One thing you want to mark the area. I know the very first time I planted garlic, I put a, a bunch of it out in the corner of the house, and um, next thing, next spring I went out there and said, wow, why are all these broadleaf weeds coming up? It looks like they're in a row. And I started pulling them out, and then after I pulled out a couple of handfuls, I started to smell the garlic, and I remembered this is where I planted those. Um, it's a, it was a tough lesson to learn and somewhat embarrassing, but um, life goes on, I guess. We had talked about this, um, why you plant in the fall. If you don't, you'll get just one onion-like type of a plant, and it's um, really not um, even of a, a decent size in most cases. So if you plant in the spring versus the fall, go with the fall. Usually on the 4th of July is when we harvest. I know some people will say, well, is it exactly the fourth? And well, no, of course not. But um, what I do is I look at the outer leaves. As your garlic is growing, it has leaves like a like a corn plant or like a grass type of a plant. And then the very outer leaves that were green start to turn brown, and they brown up. Um, then that's the time to dig them, and that's usually around July fourth. And so I always tell everybody about July fourth or so, give or, give or take a week, is a very good time frame for that. Skates. On the top of the garlic, there's a, a almost like a corkscrew or a pigtail type of a growth, and um, that's where the, that's called a scape. And the scape is a portion of the plant that produces little bubbles or little tiny future garlic plants. And what you want to do is one either remove them, and this will cause your garlic on the bottom to become quite a bit larger. Um, I know I have five to twenty-five percent here. But in most cases where I have removed it compared to ones that I haven't growing at the same time, the 25% is um, is very common to to get at least that much of a of a size difference. So if you want larger garlic, you remove the scapes. Now, for example, if you only have a few garlic plants and you would like to join or you would like to um, increase your your number of garlic that you're growing and don't really care or mind having to wait a few a couple seasons or three two or three seasons for it to actually get of any size, I would take those um, scapes in the, when, the, when you harvest your plants and they're, they'll dry, the stock will dry down, and I would plant them 
and what will happen is they'll grow, but they'll be so small the first season, you'll be like, no, they're not harvesting that. And the following season, it might be okay. And the third season will be actually quite a nice size. And so that's where um, scapes come in handy. You can really increase your, your volume of your um, crop that way. And, and usually um, when I've had them, it, they're not always the same number, but um, on, on the top of the, of the garlic where the scape is growing, many times they'll be up to from, from 5 to, to 15 to just a small handful of maybe 30 or 40 um, from each plant. And that we can really increase your garlic that way. Um, one, one important thing is though, if you do remove them, they're, they're fantastically tasty um, and, and very hard to find, especially here. I've never found them for sale and they are a very tasty type of a treat. I would describe them as tasting like, um, well, if you had beans and you fried garlic with them, that's what it would, it would taste like. It, it's, it's very delicious. We talked about the little bubbles on the top um, when you leave it on and go on from there. Digging. Digging is very important. Many times I have gone out and said, oh, I'm just going to pull these. They look like they'll come out. One will come. The rest will all break off. When they break, they get damaged. Um, hard to replant because the tunic is ripped and even the garlic sometimes rips in half or it gets dirt in there and it's just, it's just a mess. Um, I use a potato fork. I've used a shovel before, but many times when I've used a shovel, I've actually sliced them in half or in, in just chopped off chunks of them. So using a potato fork is uh, much always a way of, of making your success rate uh, a little bit better, and I would suggest that. So if you can, use a potato fork and dig it, dig it out. And what I do is I'll actually push down the potato fork maybe five or six inches away from, from where the, maybe like five or six inches away from where you're guessing it is. Go down at least um, seven, eight inches, push it down in there, and then I will push down with one hand on the fork and I will hold the plant in the other and gently pry and, and pull it up at the same time and um, in most cases it'll come right out that way. Here's a picture of the scapes um, and, and they are quite a fantastic delicious type of a thing and, and if you look at the price here um, they're five dollars a bunch which should be a, a very good profit um, for, for almost a waste product unless you ate it yourself. So, um, Also when I dig I brush the soil off and I don't wash them the reason I don't wash them is everyone I've ever talked to about this and everything I've ever looked up with it is that when you wash it, it doesn't, they don't keep as long. And so I just brush the soil off and if it's a little wet and sticky when I pull them out for some reason, I will just let them dry and then brush them off at a later date. And they tend to keep quite well that way. Octobers are the best from my experience. Um, I know some of the people that are growing them and selling them in stores now, um, little private stores, uh, different types of um, niche markets and such. Um, they they will plant these all different times, but um, they've always gone back to October. The reason being is that if you plant them too early, they just do not produce a decent crop. The plant, the, the crop will be very small, it, the yield will be small, it'll be like you left two scapes on, just a very tiny, miserable little garlic. But if you wait until October, and um, it starts growing, that's great. And sometimes they'll even poke their head out of, the, out of the ground before the snow comes, and that's perfectly fine. And in the spring, sometimes they'll pop right through the snow, and it's nothing to be stressed about. Just leave them alone, and they'll, they'll do just fine. Storage. Um, I try not to have them touching, but I do kind of bundle them together. I leave the whole plant together. Um, the the cloves or the bulbs onto the, the stock until it completely dries down and I usually just stick them underneath a shelf in a garage somewhere in a dark place and they, they, they cure really nice that way and then when their October comes around I'll go through and I'll, I'll break off the largest ones and replant those and the rest I'll just use myself for, for cooking and um, found it to be very successful that way and it's done quite well. If you look around the area, most people will grow the stiff neck. Some people will grow the silver. The problem is though, that when you plant the silver neck, um, garlic like the type you find in the grocery stores in most cases, um, instead of you know four to eight or ten, what have you, different cloves in there, you might have 25 to 30 very small little tiny cloves in there. It's just a miserable process to peel them, and so I don't recommend it. However, the silver neck garlic, 
when you plant it, does braid very nicely. A lot of times the braids you find are silver neck garlic when you buy a big bunch of garlic that's braided. The stiff neck garlic um, tends to break when you try to braid it, and it's harder to braid. However, um, I'd rather have a crop that you didn't have to braid versus no crop at all, so or a crop that's um, quite miserable to, to work with. So. Here's just a reference um, for this material, a lot of, for the reference for number one. Um, I got that from the NASS reports, USDA. Um, quite a fascinating type of a, a publication. Uh, I read a, on a number of different crops, um, not just only garlic, but um, I definitely, if you have a chance, um, just type in NASS and then USDA, and um, you'll find a number of different reports that you can use. And here's one, too, on, um, here's some scapes that are growing, they're not as far along as, as a, this is the size I usually pick them, just another reference here. If you have questions of this, we maybe wait till the end, otherwise, um, sometimes when I've broken it up, uh, we don't even get to the second talk, so let's maybe focus on this next one here. Uh, tulips, um, there are a number of different types of tulips, and I have some pictures here that um, I'll just kind of go through. Um, Some of my, my favorite are just the single early tulips. A lot of times uh, people want the doubles and such, but I like the single earlies. They just remind me of a, just a, a real nice, delicate flower that um, is just fantastic. Uh, a little story about tulips. I've always tried to find different ones and, and rare ones and such. And I found some beautiful black tulips a, a few years back. They were just fantastic. They're about $6 a bulb. I was just tickled. I got four bulbs. I went outside and planted them. And as soon as I got turned around, I looked, and squirrels came out of nowhere, dug them up in a matter of a few seconds, and dragged them off to the trees. And so um, $24, $24 just thrown away, basically. Um, so now what I do, I will plant, uh, when I plant my tulips, as I'm planting them, I'll put a little bit of um, garlic powder and dried ground red pepper, and they're easy to get. Um, sprinkle a little bit around there, and they tend to stay away from it. Or you can use, you know, like dried blood or plant skin, too, but it tends to stink a little bit. But um, if you don't have some type of protection, the rodents will get in there and um, you'll be very sorry. Uh, this is, um, I like these, um, sometimes you'll cross them too and they'll get different types of things. Here's one called Triumph Salvo. Um, very nice looking tulip. So if you have a certain color in mind or even um, sometimes some of the different bicolored ones, um, you can usually find them. Um, sometimes you might have to pay a little bit more though for those. Here's some of the Darwin hybrids. Another cross, some um, late and early tulips. Um, one nice about some of these is um, 24 inches tall. Not a bad, bad size for these. When you're planting tulips, one thing, and this is with any type of flower too, um, what I've always encouraged people to remember is it's it's for yourself, or if you're trying to press others or what have you, keep that in mind when you're planting. So. Um, sometimes you have a property and it's like, wow, I wish we could add a little life to it. It's kind of boring. So you use them to plant your, your flowers or tulips of beautification. Um, if you're not sure, what I do is I plant all different types. So I always have a mix. Um, some people would never do that. They'd have more of a, a pattern to it. I just have a mix of several different types all growing in different spots. Sometimes they overcross. Or sometimes you just want to curb appeal, you know, for example, if you have a, a home or business and um, you really want to push to sell it or what have you. Putting some tulips in there really would help with that. One thing that you want to remember, it is a plant um, and they're not plastic. So a lot of times um, if you put them in a, a place where there's water coming out of your you know, sump pump or, or what have you. Oops. It looks like just one. Oh, I'm sorry. It looks like one person lost audio. I was hoping not everybody did. Um, maybe the rest fell asleep. Anyways. Um, Put it someplace where it won't be constantly wet. I know I've talked to people that have planted them in and they, well, we have our sump pump holes running out there and, um, well, they pretty much made a muddy mess and drowned them. Or downspouts by there. You can put them next to the downspout, but right where the water comes out, not a good idea. And any other type of low areas of your property is it's also kind of hard on them. They do need light. And if, if you don't get six to eight hours of actual light. And some people say, well, we get partial sun. That's really not good enough. Um, they'll die out. I have a place on my, pro my house um, where I plant them. I just have to replant them every year because they just don't get enough light and they actually die. Um, one nice thing is that they will flower before most deciduous trees will break buds. So when you're planting them, 
and they do get some light at that time too, but as the tree starts to get their leaves and such, you, you kind of lose that light, and so you might not have six to eight hours, and that's kind of a guess. Um, but they do like six to eight hours of light. If not, growing them as an annual would be the, the right way to do it. Here's the location. If you look, um, there really isn't any sun here. Um, these will have to be replanted every year. He's got some crocus and other things in there too, but the tulips. Um, just imagine that area without the tulips. It'd be kind of a boring, um, kind of, wow, something should be done there. But just those few colors really adds a lot to the area and, and adds a lot. So the biggest problem here though, again, is that this is a shady area and these will all need to be replanted or something else planted there because they, they just won't survive it. Uh, here's one by a tree, but this is also a location where it's very sunny. And these um, look a little bit thicker, as you can see. They, they come back every year, and um, just a nice location. So if you get a nice sunny location where they get good sun, they will, they will do, obviously, a lot better. And you don't always have to replant them or treat them like an annual. And like I said, you can grow them in shade, and I do that too, but you do have to replant them every year. And if you don't, um, you'll be kind of disappointed. I know that... Um, Sometimes people will forget and say, well, my tulips all died. It must have been um, mice or rabbits or squirrels or what have you ate them all. But if you look, um, you dig down in there, you can't even, you know, the bulb will be there, but it'll be all rotten or it'll be, the roots will be small and it'll be all dried up. And what happens is it just didn't have enough um, food reserves in there. Uh, here's a question I looked over here. Um, can you plant tulips in raised bed gardens? Um, yes and no. It's one of those questions where... Um, if your raised bed garden is like eight inches high and eight feet wide, of course you can. But if you have like um, a four foot high raised bed garden and it's a one foot by ten, um, they'll freeze. Um, sometimes people have put insulation in there. Sometimes like, for example, when you buy your, I think it's called pink. There's other probably other types or two varieties of it where you put that on your house. Um, some type of insulation, that has seemed to work before. If you bury the whole thing with snow or straw and then snow, a lot of times that might work too. But um, as far as raised beds and gardens, if I were to do it, I'd put in the very middle of the raised bed is how I would do it. And if there's other questions, I didn't see those, so we can come back to them if there were. Um, and, then when, and when you go into your um, place to buy them or your box store or nursery, um, these are just a few things that I found to be successful that I really suggest. Um, you want to make sure they're hardy. There are some varieties that are just not hardy. Um, there's some varieties that you can grow in pots indoors and such, and they're just not really hardy enough to be outside. Um, there's also, for example, I had a Peruvian tulips one time, and they just can't handle the winters here. And I left them out, and they all died. Um, I knew better, but I thought, well, you know, being a horticulturalist, they'll just live because of me living in the home, and they didn't. Um, so they all died, and it's just a little humbling lesson to learn. But yeah, make sure that they're hardy for your zone. Um, try to get the largest bulbs. If you have a, a number of bulbs there to choose from and you're picking them out by hand, pick the largest ones. Make sure there's the tunic is not damaged, no disease, no insects on them, no damage at all. They should not have a smell and should not have mold. Um, sometimes you'll buy these and the people working there will say, oh, that's how they all come. I would probably go somewhere else. Um, if, that, if all their tulips are damaged or have a smell or are moldy, um, there's more likely a place you can buy them or you could order online. I, I prefer to buy locally if I can, but if that's not an option, online. And even just say when you order them, um, don't send me any rotten, smelly, moldy, or damaged tunics or, or bulbs, and um, they'll be accommodated because they want you back as a, as a customer. So keep that in mind. Uh, large bulbs tend to have larger flower blooms and stronger plants. It's a, to me, it's kind of a common sense thing, but if you're not thinking about it when you purchase these, you might not even go that route. They're, they're actually considered to be a true bulb. Um, sometimes we'll get into the flowering bulbs, and I use bulbs in quotes here because they're not all bulbs, but tulips are considered to be a true bulb. So if you want to impress your friends, say, well, tulips are a true bulb, and um, they'll be very impressed. That, you know, if you haven't ever seen one other than these pictures, um, rosette stems, fleshy leaves, and the one nice thing about the stems and the leaves is that they do store nutrients here also. So um, one thing is when you have your tulips, try not to, um, when they're done flowering, try to let them stay green, the leaves green for as long as you can. And what they'll do is keep um, growing and they will store and make food for the future bulbs. And that are going to be coming the following year and next flowers. And so um, try to leave them stay there as long as you can. 
here's just a very nice picture of of a tulip that's been cut in, or a tulip bulb that's been cut in half. Um, if you look on the left, you'll see that you know the tunic. You can see that's the outer papery portion. The flower bud is in the center. Um, fleshy leaves on the outside, the basal stem and roots. So these are all very common. Um, nothing too um, earth shattering about this, but here's just a nice picture of what one looks like. So you don't have to cut your own apart. When you when you purchase your tulips too, always look at the bottom too. It's like wow, these look fantastic. But if the, if it looks like um, something's took a bite out of the bottom of it, or it's it's broken or chipped or cracked on the bottom, stick it right back. Um, what will happen is it, it it could grow, and if it does, it will just be a poor plant that just does not have much for growth, and the flower might even not um, develop because it just doesn't have it to, to produce enough. So make sure that it's a good good healthy bottom or basal plate. One thing, if you want to just be basically a, a landscaper in your own right for your own self, um, plant in odd numbers. It's, if you plant in even numbers, it just isn't right. Um, planting in odd numbers, though, when you plant with flowers and such, and tulips is not even, you know, it's the same way. Um, you plant so that um, numbers are odd. So if you have, um, just you just want a couple, put in three, not two, or put in five, not six. And that's that's the way to go, and they'll look so much better. Also, when you plant, and for example, let's say you have an area that you'd like to plant, and you want people to visually see it, you want to have a, a triangular with a point toward viewing the area. And so when you look at it, you, it kind of expands out, and um, you'll see what I'm talking about here in just a little bit. I believe I have a picture of that. Um, as you here's here's seven in a hole. Um, just um, this hole isn't quite. You know, I, 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 this is a picture where I'd say that the hole is not quite deep enough, but um, you'll pay for that later if you don't get it deep enough. Here's what I was talking about. As you can see, as as you're walking toward the house, uh, if you're going from right to left, um, you plant it in a V. It just gives it such a nice uh, variation and just gives it kind of a movement or a flow even. Now, if you were to come from the other direction, it just kind of diminishes and goes into nothing. But here, it just gets bigger and bigger and bigger. Um, so that's one one way to do it. Mid September to, to through right on up to the frost. I know one year um, I had bought my tulips and forgot to plant them, and it was getting toward the end of October. And what I did, I went out there and it was snowing, and there I was, snowstorm, planting tulips outside, and um, it really makes your neighbors wonder if you're if you're really playing with all your marbles, but. If you're um, planting out in a snowstorm, you're planting tulips. I would, I would say, hey, you know what you're doing, because um, not getting them in the soil means no tulips next spring. So get them in there. Sometimes people try to plant or say, well, I saved them from last year and I, I want to plant them this spring. Many times they'll be rotten by then, or they'll they'll grow, but they won't produce a flower. So you got to get them in in the fall. Call before you dig. Each state has their own different um, call protection type of a line, um, you'd be amazed what's what's buried. You know, For example, here if you look, they've got electrical outlet or uh, electrical box and uh, it looks like everything in their house comes in at this one spot. I would not be digging there for any reason, but um, it looks like they are um, they're digging. So if you don't call before you dig, you can cut several different lines or even electrocute or blow up a gas line or cut some phone lines. Um, and and I know in our state, and I believe in other states too, you can check. Um, it is a free call for homeowners, so why not do it and be safe? If you're going to plant these, what you want to do is prepare your soil. So I would till the soil about 10 to 12 inches, um, and then add organic matter. And, and the easiest one to get is um, peat moss. Um, there's there's just tons of it here. I know other people can buy it too. Um, easy to get. You can add other organic matter too. You could use compost and manure. You can use other types of things too, but um, peat moss is the easiest one to get. And then I would um, put that in the hole in the bottom, and then I would add some soil, and then I would plant it so that the tulips are about six inches um, from the top of that, and um, it'll be really nice. And also um, fertilizing, you need to fertilize your tulips, and there are so many different types of fertilizer out there that I would say that what you do is go to your store and try to get just a basic, simple one. That um, it's easy and, and you're comfortable applying. You don't need um, different types either. Just get something that has um, three numbers: you know, nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium, and follow the directions on there. Let's see here. Okay. 
And we talked about this, five to six inches deep. And then water your area. And then another thing too, like I like to do is add the um, different types of uh, rodent type of things to keep it away from there. Um, so I'll get some garlic powder and dried ground red pepper and I'll sprinkle that right over the top when I'm done. It smells like you're cooking lasagna or something all day long. Um, or also I'll put some, you know, like for example, um, just an example, maybe some plant skid or some dried blood from the nursery or what have you. And I, I'll add some of that to the area just to keep the rodents out of there. Um, my experience here is that if you don't, um, you're just feeding the wildlife. So. One thing, too, you can add is like some mulch, just in a couple inches or so would be nice. Um, sometimes I do that, sometimes I don't. But if you don't, you need to have snow cover here or else they'll just die. They just can't handle it. Um, so I would definitely um, put some mulch. In the last couple of winters, we haven't had really um, snow all year long in some areas, and it's just um, been devastating on the plants. So mulching them in is not a bad idea. Um, it also helps deter the rodents as far as they have to dig through it. So they have to actually work to get their food. Here you can see they're coming through the ground, all right through the snow. I mean, the little green there is actually some flowers popping through, little tulips. Um, and that's not always the case, but it's not impossible. And I'd say about half the time that's what they're doing. They're just pushing their way right through there, and the snow doesn't bother them at all. So don't panic if you see this and think you have to get that snow off. I would definitely just leave it alone and they'll um, come through really nice. When your tulips are done and all the petals have fallen off and you're thinking, wow, this looks really quite bad, I'd go through with a little scissors and, or some type of a clippers and I would clip those off and it'd be, it'll be an um, advantage to your plants because what will happen is the roots will now start to, instead of pushing all the flower or into the flower or into the seeds for the plant, they'll actually start saving that for the bulbs for next year and you'll you'll have a much better plant the following year. Another thing too is um, fertilizing, always follow the directions. Um, if you don't follow it, you can use, there is such a thing as over fertilizing and people have killed plants by doing that too. Um, it is something really to consider because um, not following the directions on this is usually devastating if you go too much. You can always add more, but you can't always take it off. It's kind of the rule, I guess. If you're successful, and sometimes people are, um, every three to four years is not a bad idea to dig these, um, usually in the fall, you know, maybe September or so. Um, dig them out and just divide them out. Um, you might be surprised you might have a tremendous amount of bulbs underneath there and by doing that um, you can now spread them around or give them to friends or what have you. And also what will happen is um, by replanting some in there and also moving around and, and thinning them out you actually produce a nicer plant for the following years to come in that area. They're not overcrowding and becoming a weed um, for themselves. I mean it's just similar to garlic too except for the temperature thing. Um, you just don't brush them. You just brush them off. You don't wash them, and keep them in a cool, dark place, uh, 65 or lower. If you keep them any higher, they tend to have some problems. They might start growing. They might just shrivel up. Um, the garlic, I've had that in the garage, and um, it's been hot. I'd say 80, 90 degrees, and didn't phase it at all. Even some years when it's been cooler, it didn't seem to bother bother at all. But the tulips, you want to keep cooler. Um, if there's any questions or if anybody wants Julie to plant garlic or tulips at their home, um, we could all entertain those ideas right now unless you had something else. Hey, wait, Julie. Todd. <laughs> any questions for Todd? Who'd be happy to come to your home and plant your tulips? <clears throat> if you pay for your flight, it might, might be a possibility. <laughs> and you know, one thing too with garlic, it, it's a plant that um, people didn't realize they could grow here. Um, there's just such a small place, or just a very few people that, that kind of grew it. Um, and I always tell people, well, why not try it? You know, if it's, it's really cheap. Um, let's see here. Best place to find garlic. Um, right now in town, the nurseries, I know Tochi's um, has it here. Um, the nurseries are carrying it also. Garlic balls need to be planted before the frost. The thing with that is um, sometimes if after a frost or if the ground is too hard you can't take a shovel into it, I don't think you're going to be planting it. So um, like I said, I planted it and the ground was not frozen yet, but um, 
it was quite um, quite cold when I planted that one day. When and how long do you store tulips after dividing? You'll need to plant them that fall. So what I've done is, um, for example, now I let's say I had a really thick clump. Um, right now in, in our area here in the state and in probably Minnesota too, I would take and um, I would I would dig those up and probably all about well, a few days from now or even any time now if the soil is dry. And I would dig them up and I would just gently brush them off. And um, you know, the ones that um, say you had you, you popped out ten of them, I put I put um, maybe five back in the hole and space them out and add some fresh soil and such. And then the other ones I would use for um, I would use and move them around to a different spot. So I'd probably start planting those um, you know, next week or so, or in two weeks, I mean. But the ones that you dug out, I would just slide them right back in the hole. And the other ones that you're moving, I'd probably pull them out and let them sit for a couple weeks. We harvest our garlic scapes this year, and I used them in buttermilk. Thank you for making me hungry, whoever sent Roanne. Thank you, I, now that I'm hungry for that. Um, thank you. Yeah, the scapes are really good. Um, the first time I saw them, I, I, I didn't realize they were edible. But um, yeah, what, what I do is I just cut them up and just throw them in a stir fry, and, and they're just fantastic. So, um, but I've done it the other way too, and I've left them in the little plot and little little balls on the top. They are, are quite nice. What are garlic chives? Um, my understanding, unless and I might be mistaken on this, but garlic chives are just a type of chive that has a garlic flavor. Um, if they were growing right next to your regular chives, they might look slightly different, but they they're not going to really be all that different as far as looks. Um, so, I don't know if there's any other questions. Um, don't be shy. You can use someone else's name as your own if you don't want to ask that question. But um, one thing, I, when I when I first started planting garlic, I didn't know what kind to get, and so what I did, I bought um, eight different kinds, and I kept them separate. And as time went on, I always kept the biggest ones from all eight. And then one year, I decided, you know what? I like all eight. They're all different, um, slightly different color, slightly different intensity for flavors. And so what I did, I just kept the largest ones, and now they've all been mixed together, and it really isn't um, that big of a deal to me. I know that some people might like Killarney or Spanish Rose all over the other one or what have you, but to me, um, if I'm growing it, I just love it, and so I really don't care. Right now, I think out of the eight, there's about maybe four varieties that I could pick out that are um, still easy to pick out, like the Spanish rolls on the Killarney and music. Um, they're all pretty easy to pick out, but even if I just had one variety left, um, I'd be pretty happy with it. So what I would do is um, try different varieties and go from there. Some people, too, will, um, you know, if you haven't experienced this, you can, you can try some of these other things, too, leeks and also um, different types of onions. Uh, there's a number of different things to try. You know, planting it and failing is better than, than not planting it and just wondering if it would have worked. So, um, yeah, different types of tulips. Um, you know, what I do is I always go into the store and um, I always try to find the tallest ones. I don't know why I just do that. And so I'll pick the tallest ones that are, grown, are, are available. And then I also, you know, after that, then I'll go with colors. And um, it's been very rewarding. Um, there's nothing like coming home in the in the spring and um, when everything's kind of brown and still kind of yellowish brown and nothing really too exciting to look at. You pull up to your house and it's one of the few that has a number of tulips growing around it. Really makes you feel good. So um, I'd recommend it. Yeah. Any other other questions or? Um, I have Julie's cell phone number if you wanted to set up times for her to come and plant. Um, she usually likes to be called um, after 10 at night. Um, here's someone that talked about how to, um, and you can all read that, how to get the, the, um, the, the tunics off the clothes. Um, and there, there's a number of different products for that. Um, so one thing a person could do is, um, you know, um, I don't have that, so when I do it, my hands just reek of garlic for a while, and I, you know, it, it's nice that way. You don't have to talk to people because you can kind of smell that way, and they stay away from you. So either way is fine. But no, there are some very nice tools for doing that. I know I've seen people that have had them, and um, they'll just, you know, peel a, peel all the tunics off of garlic in a matter of a second or two. It, it's quite fascinating. So um, not to promote any stores, but there's a number of different specialty stores that that do carry things, or even some of the regular stores too. 
different things that will husk these or take those tunics right off of there. Garlic capital of the world. I think that um, if Julie has hasn't given away that door prize, maybe she, everyone that's on here could um, get a plane ticket from her and go out to this garlic capital and check out that festival. It's just another option versus her planting all this garlic for everyone. I think I'd probably go at the garlic festival one. So, um, yes, I yes, I am paying. That's right. Um, Anyways, if anyone has any other questions, great. Or if you if you don't and you want to ask me a different time, um, you sure can. Um, I'll type in my um, my email here. Oops. If I could spell my last name, it'll be better. And this is Julie. I'd like to thank all of you for coming today. I hope you enjoyed it. I I am uh, ready to go out and get some. Some tulip bulbs to try. <laughs> yeah, um, and like I said, um, you can, you know, it, you, even if you're just, even if you've learned just one thing from this, um, um, the one thing that I, I really wished I had known was um, to protect those from rodents after you plant them. We have so many rabbits and squirrels and who knows what else, field mice in the area. Um, I, you definitely need to protect them, or else. Um, even planting a tremendous amount, I think they'll just eat everyone eventually. So try to protect them one way or another. And, um, if there aren't any questions right now, I'll please send them to me when you get a chance. And thank you. Hey, it was John, very this enjoyable. is Scott. Do you want me to put that YouTube video up on the, in the chat area? That would be great. Um, there's a YouTube video that um, we couldn't get to, to work on this, but it's um, if, you, if you didn't get enough of me, you could sure take a look at this. It's a real simple, very easy um, YouTube that you'll just love. It, it's just fantastic. Not just because I'm in it, but it's very easy to understand. And um, I've had a lot of people looking at it and um, a lot of good comments on it. It's just right to the point, easy way of planting and harvesting garlic. So right there it would be. Um, and if you can't find that, just type in Todd Wyman, NDSU um, um, YouTube videos, and uh, they'll, they'll pop up too. I've got other ones too, but. Uh, my garlic one is one that people really enjoy. So, and we will archive this website in case I notice some of you popped in late. It will be archived on the Field to Fork website. And next week, two Central Time, we'll be back with Food Fermentation 101. So, thanks everybody for joining us, and thank you, Todd. Oh, thank you. It was, it was a lot of fun, and. Um, I can't wait for the next ones to come up here. So. <laughs>